Well, I'm going to get started. Thank you very much. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Amy Gilbert. My author name is A.H. Gilbert, my first initials, Amy Hathaway Gilbert. And I've written a ghost story. It's called The Crandall Haunting. It's a story of murder and revenge. Up here. I'm going to read from chapter two. Um, chapter one is a bit scary, and I thought I probably should go right into chapter two which is less scary. This reading is going to take about 20 minutes, so you know what you're in for here. In this chapter, we meet our protagonist for, for the first time. Uh, really, it doesn't need any more introduction. It's chapter two, present day, Syracuse, New York. Emerson's cell phone chirped as he finished his 50th push-up. Good excuse. He was going to add 10 more today, but instead he pushed himself up with a grunt and found the phone. Hello? Hi, Emerson. Is that you? Well, of course it's you. What a silly question. Who else would answer your phone using your voice? Hi, Gary, his partner. Well, I've got some bad news. Gary was uncharacteristically direct. Emerson took four strides to the refrigerator that rattled in the tiny indentation he called the kitchen. Let's hear it. He tucked the phone against his ear with his shoulder and opened the refrigerator, reaching for the carton of orange drink. We're canceled. He paused, carton halfway to his lips. What does that mean? We're done, man. The Aggies canceled our funding. They said we have to, they have to reallocate their funds to the Asian Longhorn Beetle, which, to quote, is rapidly becoming an epidemic in virtually all varieties of maple in Massachusetts, as well as attacking the ashen poplar, I might note. I know what the Asian Longhorn Beetle is. Apparently, the Asian Longhorn Beetle is considered to be of greater importance than the Hemlock Looper. Emerson put the carton down and stepped to the window. A plump, dark woman was walking a fluffy white dog across the street. It pulled on the leash, lunging against its harness to get its nose to the base of a light pole. The woman didn't notice the frantic tugging, and she dragged the frustrated creature along easily at the end of an orange leash as she talked into a cell phone. Emerson watched her dully, a distant gaze in his dark blue eyes, his th thoughts darting around Gary's news. It was bad. Can we appeal the decision? I mean, they pretty much guaranteed us another two years. Oh, I suppose we could write to someone, the board, the committee, the president, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. But you know how stubborn Aunt Aggie is when she makes a decision. Aunt Aggie was one of Gary's many nicknames for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which funded their research. So what do we do, just turn off the lights and lock the lab? Emerson ran one long hand across his forehead and into his dark hair, which hadn't seen a barber's clippers in a few months. He noticed a rusty hatchback pulling into a no-parking zone across the street. The driver, a middle-aged woman, turned to the child in the seat next to her, taking hold of the young girl and hugging her. Well, we could stage a protest, let the loopers loose, Gary was saying. That would show them. Do they have any hemlocks on the grounds of the Department of Agriculture in D.C.? Maybe we could fling some loopers at the president's motorcade. Can you imagine the coverage? The news coverage, I mean, not the coverage of the motorcade with loopers. Hey, we could get some donations, some sympathy do donations from the antis and professional protesters. No, wait, they're always broke. Emerson turned away from the window as Gary prattled on. They would actually probably have to kill the loopers. An odd thought after he had worked with the little striped caterpillars for so long. Maybe we could ask the Saudis, Gary was saying. All right, Gary, Emerson cut in. I've got to think. I'll talk to you later. Sorry. Me too. Bye. Emerson sat on the bed. He hadn't yet folded it back into a couch. Great. No more money for their research also meant no more income for him, meager as it was, just enough to keep this cheap studio in a questionable neighborhood, barely enough to keep gas in his ailing 12-year-old car, enough to buy imitation orange juice but not real orange juice. He couldn't say that they were close to finding a way to eradicate the looper, but they were definitely making some progress. This sudden change made his last two years of work seem... Well, useless. Useless. He had heard that word so often. The image of his smirking father wedged its way into any fleeting optimism he tried to muster. While Emerson was in college, his father never missed a chance to harangue him about his choice of majors, 
although admittedly he did help pay for it. To his father, biology was only useful if it led to medical school. It's leading his only child to a solitary, low-income life in a lab full of insects was, to his father, a complete waste of time and money. To his father, it made no sense to work so hard at anything that didn't involve a big financial payoff or notoriety, or best of all, both. Any conversation they had attempted in recent years revolved around his father trying to belittle and bully Emerson into foregoing this work and instead coming to work for him. That concept repelled Emerson as much as it enthralled his father, who longed to have his son working by his side. Now Emerson was about to become destitute with funding hard to find, but he still couldn't tolerate the idea of going to work for his father. That thought made him feel almost physically ill. He would have to be nothing less than desperate to do it. Emerson couldn't ever imagine getting to that point. Even a job waiting tables or serving burgers would be better than that. He could just hear his father's disgust if he heard that his master's degreed son was working in a fast food restaurant. Hell, it would probably pay better than this research grant. He sighed and stood, stepping toward the shower, which was set with a sink and a toilet in an alcove off the kitchen. A plastic accordion-style door separated it from the rest of the room. Just then, he thought he heard a quiet tapping at the door. Two little knocks. He froze, naked, and listened. Tap, tap. Just a minute. He rummaged in his dirty clothes hamper for a pair of shorts. Stepping to the door, he put his eye to the peephole. He could see the top of a small head. Who is it? It's me, said a little voice, almost too quiet to hear. Emerson pulled back the chain and turned the deadbolt. He opened the door to see a little girl about three feet high with straight, dark brown hair and deep blue eyes. She looked at him with an expression of mingled curiosity and fear. A lanky six foot two, he towered over this little person. He scratched the head at his chest absently as he looked back at her. What can I do for you, he said, not knowing how to address this little kid. She took a deep breath, stared at his knees, and spoke as though she were reciting something she had memorized. My name is Courtney. I'm seven. I'm in second grade. You're my father. That stated, she glanced up at him shyly and then looked back at his knees. As, his, as her words sunk in, a woman appeared in the doorway. She bore an overall rumpled appearance with a tired, middle-aged face. Her body was soft and pudgy and bulgy under a baggy, long-sleeved sweet t-shirt and sweatpants. Are you Emerson? She said. Yes, he said. The bug guy? Yeah, you could say that. What's going on? She thrust a pink child-sized knapsack in his hands. This girl is yours. Her mother was in an accident, and she can't take care of her. She's in a coma. Hit and run, she added, anger flitting across her face. What? He heard her words, but they didn't make sense. I brought her all this way for you because she's a good kid, and she has a good mother. But that's all I'm doing. I I've got too much. Her face was sad and utterly exhausted. Then she looked at him with a hardened expression and said, Ask the child. She has all the information for you. Her eyes rested for a moment on the girl. Then she said, Goodbye. She hurried down the hallway and out the front door with surprising speed. Emerson looked at the little girl who was staring back at him. He heard a car engine start and he hurried to the window to see the hatchback pulling away from the curb. He tried to open the window, but it was painted shut, as he already knew. Hey! He yelled, sla slapping the glass as the car disappeared down 4th Street. Hey! Stop! Can I come in? Courtney asked quietly, glancing uneasily down the dark and dingy hallway. Muffled shouting came from one of the other apartments, and the hallway stank of old fried food and cigarettes. No, he said, feeling panicky, stepping back to the girl. My mother said, if I ever met you, I should show you this. She held up a glassy, a glossy colored photo. He took it, frowning. It showed a group of people on the dock of a lake. They were holding cans of cheap beer and smiling. He was one of them, and he had his arm around a woman. He remembered that day. It was a graduation party, 
a small group of the science students celebrating the end of their college careers. They had earned their degrees and were preparing to start jobs. Barry Ross had invited them to his dad's cabin on Loon Lake up in the Adirondacks. He gazed at the woman in his arm. He remembered her, too. Annie Hughes, a sweet, smart botanist who had been in some of his classes over the previous couple of years and surprised everyone that weekend by revealing a delightful bikini-clad body. She was normally hidden in baggy shirts and loose jeans, and Emerson never would have guessed that she could be so appealing. Apparently, she had liked him pretty well, too, because they had ended up making love several times over the course of that weekend, in the lake, in the woods, in the tent. It was sweet and fun, but it didn't last beyond those intense 48 hours. She was slated to start research on the Aleutian Islands the next week, and he was coming to Syracuse to work on his study aimed at preventing the emerald ash beetle from spreading into New York. They sent a couple emails and had tracked each other on social media for a while, but they both seemed to know that it was just one of those goofy episodes that was never meant to be anything else. Except, apparently, it had become something else, and that something else was standing in his doorway, now looking like she was about to cry. He watched her with consternation. Emerson's total experience with children was limited to conducting school field trips at the nature preserve. Watching her eyes fill up with tears, he knew he needed to stave off her crisis so he could focus on his own. He drew on what he could. Want to see a really cool bug? The girl looked at him in surprise, then nodded. Come on. She stepped through the door and he closed it behind her. He showed her a light, lighted glass terrarium atop a press board stand. Can you see the bug? She looked intently through the glass. He watched her dark blue eyes examining mossy sticks, leaves, and rocks as she turned her head this way and that to see under objects. Where is it? I'll give you a hint. It looks like a stick. She continued to look, but after a moment said, I can't see it. Look up. A long greenish-brown bug was perched upside down on the screen covering the terrarium. It was about four inches long, no thicker than a cocktail straw, and it had long legs with knobby joints. I see it, she said. That's a bug? It's called a walking stick. Why does it look like a stick? For camouflage. It looks like a stick so birds won't see it. That way it won't get eaten. She looked back at the bug in wonder. What's its name? I haven't thought of one yet. Maybe you can think of one. Kind of scary. I'll be right back. I have to make a phone call while you're thinking of a name. He set down the knapsack and looked up at the phone, at the, looked up the phone number to the police and punched it on his phone. He looked back at the little girl who was watching the bug and thinking hard, her almost black hair falling across her pale cheek. On impulse, he stopped the call and went to his closet. Reaching up, he pulled out an old, worn photo album. In its first few pages, he found what he was looking for, his kindergarten photo. He looked at the photo and back at Courtney's thin face with those deep blue eyes surrounded by long, dark lashes. His face was different now, of course, with a straight, his straight nose, long, arching brows, and angled jaw. But still, there was no doubt about it. They could have been brother and sister, or father and daughter. He felt weak. He sat down heavily on the bed. A daughter. If he called the police, what would happen? They would try to find that woman, maybe, and the girl's mother, and the girl would be sent to temporary foster care. That was probably the best solution. Then his, his mind abruptly bounced over some memories of news stories about foster parents not being kind to their children, abusing them. Surely they weren't all like that. The girl noticed his intense stare. You could call him Sticky, she said. Sticky? Uh-huh. That's a good name. Okay, from now on, she's Sticky. She? Courtney grinned, showing tiny, slightly uneven white teeth. Braces as a teenager, he thought, same as me. He realized that he needed more information before he could figure out what to do. Courtney, where do you live? What's the name of the town where your mom is? Courtney looked down. Her lip trembled. 
He got up from the couch and went to the kitchen. He pulled out a chair from his Formica table that had been, he had found at the Goodwill store. Here you go, have a seat. She sat. He reached for the orange drink, deciding she wouldn't suffer from a few of his germs from his habit of drinking out of the carton, and poured her a cup. I had to come here with Lois, she said, her voice sad. Then, apparently remembering something, she went back for her small knapsack, unzipped a pouch, and pulled out a large tan envelope. Handing it to him, she sat down again. That's from her. He looked at the envelope with apprehension. On the front, open in case of emergency, was written in large red block letters. It had already been opened, and now he pulled out the contents. The first document was apparently this girl's birth certificate with a social security card clipped to it. He read the birth certificate and felt a surge of adrenaline when he saw his own name on the line for father. He stared at it so long that Courtney said, there's a letter for you too. It was in a plain white envelope with Emerson on it in small round cursive. He unfolded the single sheet of lined paper dated a year earlier and started to read. Dear Emerson, I hoped you would never have to read this note, but if you are, it's because something has happened to me. Something that's preventing me from taking care of Courtney. So here goes. Courtney is our daughter. I know you'll see it just looking at her. And I gave her your last name. Don't ask me why I didn't tell you. I just didn't think it was fair to force you into this once I made my decision to have her. You were just starting out too and you didn't ask for this. But now if you're reading it, this, it's because I don't have anyone else I can trust to take her. I know it isn't fair, and I'm sorry for that, but I couldn't bear to see her go to foster care. One of the reasons I'm so messed up is because I spent my childhood w with some really bad foster families. Please don't do it to her. I know that you and I didn't stay close, but I also know that you're a good, gentle man. I have followed your research, and you're doing important work. Courtney is the sweetest girl with a big heart and incredible curiosity, and she's so smart. Please, please keep her safe. Thank you, Emerson. Thank you. Sincerely, Annie Hughes. Emerson's stomach tied itself into tighter knots with every line he read. He put the letter down and shuffled quickly through the few remaining documents. He paused over another note that listed his name and current address as Courtney's custodian in the event that Annie was unable to care for her. He moved here a couple years ago. She really had been keeping track of him. The packet even included a photo of him taken from a news article that when he had received the Looper grant, the bug guy. It was so weird to think all this had been going on without his knowing. The baby, Annie's careful planning, her keeping his address current in these documents. But why? Why the heck did she keep this a secret from him? He stuffed the envelope and everything else back into the envelope and went to the little girl. Kneeling on the floor, he put his hands on her shoulders. Courtney, where's your mom? Her eyes got round and wide. Bright orange drink stained the skin above her upper lip. Where does she live, he said more urgently, panic creeping into his voice. Who is Lois? Courtney! He gave her a little shake. Tears burbled out of her eyes and ran down her face as she stared at him. He pulled his hands away from her. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. She jumped up from the chair and ran to the door, trying futilely to open it, not able to reach the deadbolt. Emerson was horrified. I'm sorry, he said, it's okay. He went over to her and kneeled down again. No, she yelled, giving him a furious, useless shove. Go away, I want my mom. She dissolved into tears, clutching her knapsack. He tried to hold her, but she cried louder and fought him off. He jumped up and walked to the window, picked up his phone, put it back down. He turned to his laptop and punched in Annie's name, starting a search, but not really knowing if it would produce any magic, useful information or a solution. He focused intently on this endeavor for a few minutes, but he didn't get far before Courtney's quiet crying snapped him back to the room and the physical facts in front of him. Mainly, a real girl huddled miserably on the floor like some soggy pile of pink and purple rags. He sat down next to her, his back against the wall. It was too much. 
his research, this kid, what in hell was he supposed to do now? End chapter two. Yay. Thank you.